Bienvenidos a Reporte Jaguar, soy Marcela López Lozano. No olviden seguirnos en redes sociales, Reporte Jaguar. Y bueno, el día de hoy voy a hablar de un tema que se está escuchando por todos lados, ciberseguridad. Gobiernos están siendo atacados, banca, empresas, a nivel mundial, no solamente en México. Y bueno, aquí tengo el día de hoy como invitado a un experto en el tema, quien nos visita desde la ciudad de Toronto, en Canadá. BJ de Honorin. BJ, welcome to Mexico. Thank you, Marcelo. Thanks for inviting me. Quiero resaltar que BJ es director en ciberseguridad. Eh, él ha estudiado Quality Management en la Universidad de West Indies y también Ciencias de la Computación en la University of Western Ontario. Uh, también él está certificado como arquitecto. Y bueno, eh, como primera pregunta, todos queremos saber qué es ciberseguridad. BJ, um, what does cybersecurity mean? Cybersecurity, hmm means different things to different people, but overall it's a process of where you have to protect an organization from, from um, an attack that's coming from what we refer to as the internet, north-south traffic kind of way to speak. Cybersecurity is, has, is a practice where you have to defend every single time. It's not like you can do one configuration and walk away and expecting it's going to work the same next tomorrow. Every day is something different. Every day there's a new type of attack. Every day there's a new type of, of uh, development within cybersecurity. So the life of a cybersecurity professional is extremely interesting. You're traveling all over uh, talking about these topics. Is it a specific country that it's getting attacked the most? Or let's say the US because it's a bigger country? Absolutely not. Um, threat actors go after the least part of the of resistance, which means that they can get a lot more into uh, countries with less defense, such as Central America, South America, Latin America, because the, the cybersecurity posture is not that strong. They can actually penetrate a lot quicker and they can get into a lot of an environment. And a lot of times, the Americas, they pay. When it comes to the United States of America, they go after the big guys with a lot of money. So BSFI, or anything to do with financials, are a prime target. Vulnerability is a prime target for things like hospitals, or anything to do with PII data that can be exfiltrated. Um, when it comes to things like Europe or Asia Pacific, there's always going to be that same level of intensity. Um, now, in 2025, we have seen a lot of um, attention that's being paid with APT type of attacks and that comes with geopolitical tensions. So there is no one country where it's greater than the other. Like I said, they go after the least part of resistance where they can get the most while they build new type of attack algorithm to go after the bigger guys. But in Latin America, we are lacking of these uh, cybersecurity awareness? More so than skills and awareness and um, There's not enough regulations in Latin America and Central America and South America that forces organization to follow frameworks. The framework de facto standard today and day everyone follows is called NIS, NIS 2.0. There's a new version that's recently got released that talks a little bit more about AI and quantum computing. But if regulations are not in certain region that forces you to use those type of framework, then you have no practical process of recovering your data when you get exfiltrated. So um, for sure, the government in each country, government, banks, uh, businesses should be investing in cybersecurity, right? 100%. And every day they should be investing more so than the tools are there. Every, every bank or every, every government or every hospital already have cybersecurity tool. The complements of tools they have may not be enough, but enough that they can prevent, uh, kind of mitigate stuff from happening. But building services around what they currently have today so that they have um, a, um, uh, kind of a, a process where to follow every six months to test resiliency. So separating discussion of cyber resiliency, operational resiliency, and cyber recovery to get to the end state. So that should always be followed, and process should be in place to make sure you test those resiliency. 
there should be separate platform in an organization that if you should have an attack, you should be able to flip from, um, from A to B, anything to do with critical data. What about recovery? Um, ¿Cómo podemos hacer para recuperar? ¿Cómo pueden hacer las empresas para recuperar toda esa información confidencial que está ahí en estos sistemas? How can they recover? So recovery is a, is a, is a long discussion. Here is why. There is cyber recovery, backup and recovery. You have backup policy, you back up your data, and you bring them back when you need them to recover from a, from a failure. That failure can be disaster recovery or it can be a cyber attack. However, the speed at which your data is going to come back is going to be very, very different and it'll tell which part of the resiliency factor you're in. Second to that is that 40% of the time as we build threat intel, we, we're kind of saying that backup data aren't recoverable. That's number one. Number two, the processes hasn't been tested. So when you're trying to recover something that's got exfiltrated, you don't know what is good or what is bad. And the information is out there, right? The information is completely out there. Everything ends up in most likely the dark web, and then you get be, being sold to whoever wants to buy the information, or it's used to create a ransomware type of, of um, framework from the organization. You better pay up or you are going to lose. I'll expose all the data on the internet, and everyone will know. Then public relations become a nightmare at the same time. The other part of that is that when it comes to backup and recovery, today's world, you have to focus more on operational resiliency. You need to protect all your critical data. All, uh, those are all your source data. Put them into an environment that you can flip a switch if you need to, to keep the environment running. So regulations like DORA allows you to do that. Right? It forces you to have a, a predefined process and a predefined environment where you can go into an operational resiliency mode obligation uh, reporting uh, an incident to an authority, you have an obligation to drive within two hours, 24 hours, or 72 hours, depending on the region you're in. With artificial intelligence, how, how does it affect uh, cybersecurity? Artificial intelligence is, is, is a game changer. Um, we have seen with the um, enablement of powerful computing, we're able to churn our data, create um, large language module, short language module. Everyone is using AI today to deliver a service. That's a good part of AI. There's also a bad part of AI with a threat actor. We use data that's readily available in the big three or the big four and create their own type of attack mechanism. What that means is that APT or advanced persistent threat will become more prevalent in geopolitical issues, where they're going to create more sophisticated codes to exfiltrate an environment, or they are going to uh, go after, again, the least part of resistance. But the point to that, to artificial intelligence, it's so quick that we can't defend. That's when we go into the, for the phrase of mitigation of risk. We are going to try to defend where we can. We can't defend where we don't know. So instead of having to protect the front end 100%, protect the front end 99.9% and the one the 0.9%, we put the back end, we try to bring back that into a recovery, into a resiliency mode. Because AI is extremely, extremely fast. AI uses the compute and the environment of, um, of the new GPUs that came out today. So what that means is that the speed at which it can execute the codes is so fast is that the cybersecurity tool cannot catch it. Right? And it becomes, even though you have zero day, you have zero day log on, you have two factor authentication, this bypass all the normal mode of, of operations when it comes to cybersecurity. Now with quantum computing in sight and quantum computing in mirror, today we have quantum pre, which means that we're not quantum safe. It means our key length are shorter. And uh, if, if we are able to break the algorithm today in the type of keys that we have, then prevention is not there. Right? We, we need to start looking at going like in, in the next first quarter of 2025 to be quantum safe. And quantum safe means we have to upgrade a lot of stuff. Our key link is going to change. Our key distribution is going to change. I currently lead a task force um, that comes up with ways how to defend against quantum computing. So definitely um, any company, governments have to have a budget for this topic. Correct. And always, the one other thing that we find a lot in the industry is 
everyone thinks that cybersecurity, not security, cybersecurity, is a cost center. It actually is not a cost center because the, the amount of losses you suffer from one cyber attack outweighs the revenue that you are going to, they are going to spend in creating um, a subset of services that allows you to understand where your posture lives. And cybersecurity posture is very important to you for you to understand where is your weak point or where is your weakest point that you can get. Um, when a threat actor wants you, they get you. Because they will keep trying until they get, as long as you're worth it, they're going to go after you. They'll create new type of code. They'll come up with new innovative ways of doing it. We see it inside a threat as being one of the biggest things that's going to happen in 2025. And inside a threat is not someone just taking data from the company. This threat actor is going to befriend people in the organization. They'll give them access to the computer so they can create exfiltration if they can't get past the um, cybersecurity ecosystem. How often are companies and government getting attacked? Very, very, very often. Um, the last statistics if I remember is multiple hundreds per day. Um, where globally, it's multiple thousands per day. Um, for example, I saw some colleague in Brazil, and there are organizations or banks there who are doing like a 2.7 million transaction an hour. Um, those lead to DDoS type of attack, and DDoS are consistent attack, or APT attacks are, are persistent type of attacks that will go after the same environment to create denial of service. And that the attacks from transaction could be in the hundreds of thousands. But this happens every day, all day, with all type of organization. No one is excluded. Thank you, BJ. An advice that you would like to give us for the people who are watching this video today? Okay. Cybersecurity is not a Nintendo box. It's a practice. You have to stay abreast of cybersecurity all the time, every time. Look at your cybersecurity ecosystem. Make sure you have defense against uh, things like endpoint detect and response. You have enough logs generated or collected from your SIM system. You have an NDR or network detect and response system that actually look for data that leaving your organization. The only way you can tell what have left your organization, let's call that Northwest traffic or internet in and out, it's through an NDR system because it tells you what exfiltrated, it tells you what goes out and where they end up. If you don't have that, then your reliance become log, which is lateral movement, will give you a good indication, but you're not going to be able to tell where your data ends up. Always look at the cybersecurity posture. Do a posture assessment once every six months, at least for 2025. Then you can continue doing that once every year. Look at some, some uh, red teaming exercise but never underestimate anything when it comes to cybersecurity. Ransomware is a framework. It contains bit locks. Ransomware is going to be a thing of the past very soon because it becomes crime as a service where they sell bit lock to anyone who wants to buy it and they will go and carry it a ransomware attack. The thing to look for tomorrow, most importantly, is how AI is going to affect your environment from a negative perspective. Look, if you are in, in finance, or if you are in big data environments such as healthcare, look at things like quantum pre quantum and look at areas where you can become quantum safe because quantum computing is coming. The actual computing environment is a ways out, but quantum pre and quantum is here today. So the, 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 the defense mechanism we have for quantum today is not strong enough when GPU are enabling AI system to be extremely powerful compute environment. BJ Donarian, thank you very much for your time. You're very welcome, Marcel. Thank thanks you for, for inviting. Uh, thanks for sharing your knowledge with us. Okay, thank you again. Thank you. Okay. Bueno, y muchas gracias a BJ, experto en ciberseguridad, por esta plática. Como pudieron ver aquí eh, con los subtítulos y un poco en, en inglés y en español. Y bueno, no olviden de seguirnos en todas las redes sociales de Reporte Jaguar. Y recuerden, yo soy Marcela López Lozano. Los veo en la próxima entrevista. Hasta luego.